Hello, friends. Welcome to the Your Project Shepherd podcast. I'm your host, Curtis Lawson, and we are here to teach that every successful construction project has four components demonstrated by the simple drawing of a house. The foundation is proper planning. The left wall is your team. The right wall is communication and the roof is proper execution. Have all four of these components in place and your project will succeed. We're here to help professionals and homeowners alike make the best decisions about designing, planning, and building custom homes. If you'd like more information about how Shepherd can help you with your project or business, visit us at yourprojectshepherd.com. And now, here's today's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this new episode of the Your Project Shepherd podcast. I'm Curtis Lawson, your host, and today we're going to talk about water management and the building envelope. And for that, I am joined today by Miguel Gonzalez and Milton Lozano from Tamlin. Thank you for having us, Curtis. Yep. Thank you. Excited to have you guys. So why don't you guys just take a minute to, to tell us about what your, your, your role is, your position at Tamlin, and kind of what, what you do for the company and how long you've been there and all that good stuff. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start. I am a product specialist, but I belong to the specifications department for Tamlin. So we really are sort of in the forefront when it comes to education, right? So that education has a little bit to do with why well, things sometimes go amok in the industry. But yeah, so we do a lot of CEU courses, but we also do a lot of job site training uh, going on two years with Tamlin. So uh, background is in education. So it kind of is a little fitting that I do awesome. education. So it works. Miguel? I am uh, the president and CEO of Tamlin, uh, but you know I've been in the business for gosh, I guess I came with a building, what I call it. <laughs> I, I've been in the industry for 48 years, 40 some years of construction science, with about 25 years of building science. I, I enjoy what I do, and you know we we are a manufacturer of construction products since 1971. We manufacture products. We started initially with uh, flashing and structural metal connectors um, for the hurricanes, clips and straps, and all that basic products. Then we evolved into manufacturing products with uh, water management in mind because we were following a lot of the industry and what we were manufacturing for other companies. Mm -hmm. So we were manufacturing companies, uh, manufacturing products for the what I call the 800-pound gorillas. A little bitty company like us out of Stafford, Texas, was making products for large companies across the United States. So in 2000 or so-ish, we decided that it was time for us to build our own brand. We were making products for bigger companies while they were getting all the credit with our ideas. So going in, 2000, in the 2000s, we moved into our direction of our brand. Why not us? We were the ones that had the ideas. We were the ones that had the innovation. I know it's harder because when you're the little guy, no matter how good the product is or how much better than everybody else is, money buys stuff. Okay, And that's the hard thing, the lesson that we've learned in our industry is that we might be 100 times better than the other guy, but the other guy is still the 800-pound gorilla. Mm -hmm. And my hope is through this social media that we're in, the network that we're living in today, is that the little guy and the big guy in the social media are the same size. And this is what we're doing, is really hitting the market big with the social media to show the value of what doing it right matters. That's the slogan we always use, when doing it right matters, Tamlin. This is why we're here to... Let's talk a little about about the building envelopes and rain screenings and the capillary breaks and how important they are to protect. I, I used to I hate to say this word, not Mr. Big Bucks. Mr. Big Bucks can afford to replace his home ten times, but Mr. and Mrs. Smith that borrowed money and that's the only home they'll ever own. We as manufacturers and as builders should build it like we're building it for Mr. and Mrs. Smith every single time. The unfortunate thing is that we don't, because in today's industry, there's more investors that are not focused on Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You guys have been a fantastic partner for, for Crafted, for my home building company. Um, we've had your reps and, and you out on, on several projects in the past. You know, we've, for better or for worse, kind of become known for taking over projects that somebody else uh, made a disaster out of. And so we've stepped into a couple where um, you know, the house had just been in framing stage and framing flux for a long time, a lot of water issues. The other builder was about, about to just cover it up with some stucco and going down the road. And we said, you know, let's let's rip all this off and start over. Let's get the, the Tamlin team out to talk about what the right products are to use in this situation. And so, you know, we, we, we're just super happy with, you know, your team and all the support that you always provide. 
And I, I actually think a lot of builders don't take advantage of the team members that you have. I wish they did, but they don't. That's true with a lot of manufacturers. Like I think a lot of builders, in fact, until the last few years, I, I, I wasn't even aware that I could call numerous companies that we work with and say, hey, do you have a guy that you can send out to talk to us in the field about this? And so, you know, you all have a fantastic team of very knowledgeable people that are happy to come out to the job site and help builders. And I think the ultimate goal for us is always to be used as a resource, right? We want to be able to ask people and kind of show them how, what doing it right means. And I think sometimes um, on the architectural side, designer side, they often don't know that that's an option. So on top of the fact that a yes, a CU course is wonderful, they get their little credit, everything's fine. They also get the added benefit of knowing that there's a full team out there that can support them regardless of where they are, right? They're like, yeah, I'm out here in Seattle. Well, fantastic. We got people in Seattle. You know, let's let's make that happen. So that's been a really uh, pivotal part of Tamlin from the beginning. Always, always education and make sure that you're being used as a resource because a lot of times these mistakes are just very simple uh, installation or just design um, oversights is a nice way to say it. But, yeah. you know, so. Uh, I think that it, it protects everybody in the food chain, right? It, it protects, uh, you know, doing it right protects the homeowner. It protects the builder from liability. It protects, you know, and it, obviously if, if the builder and the, and the installer do it wrong, that's not a manufacturer issue. And in fact, I had this conversation yesterday with somebody that most, uh, most kind of quote unquote product failures aren't really product failures. <laughs> the product itself has been tested and tested and tested. And it's generally not the product's fault. It's whoever put it in, didn't know how to do it the right way. And so, you know, using those resources, you know, protects a lot of people in the food chain. Well, one of the things I've learned through education and, you know, like I said, I'm as old as the buildings, um, is that I have followed the Pareto principle. Okay. And wherever you go and whatever you do, we're always going to deal with humans, right? The Pareto principle tells us that 80% are not going to do it right. 80%. There's that 20%. So how do we find that 20%? With the information highway that we are today, it's okay to get that feedback before you put it, plug it in. And the educational classes we're dealing with, the, same, the last thing an architect can do is copy and paste and be okay with it. Because there's an 80% chance you're using the wrong product. So I want, you, I want everybody to imagine the 80-20 rule. Are you using that 20 or are you just copy and paste the other 80%? And on the specification side, things have kind of moved towards a plug and play approach, right? Um, everybody, especially the bigger firms, do like the idea of once we've drawn it up, it's applicable regardless of where we are, right? Yeah. Um, you laugh, uh, but because you see how silly that is when we're looking at um, building a home that's made out of with a stucco cladding versus using a fiber cement versus using a brick, using a mixture of whatever it may be. There's a lot of variables, right? So products not only oftentimes fail because of the insulation, but they fail because they're the wrong products for that kind of uh, water damage yeah. that you're going to be getting, right? And so they don't know what they don't know. I laughed because I was <laughs> at an inspection for a house two days ago, and I was meeting with the architect and the builder and the homeowner, and they rolled the plans out, and the architect was like, you didn't follow the detail, and he pointed at a Tamlin detail <laughs> on the architect's plans, and the builder said, well, I thought that the detail only applied to the Tamlin wrap that we were putting on. I didn't realize it applied to the other things in the picture. Yeah. And so like they had, and, and then the homeowner's like you know, mad at the builder because they didn't quote unquote follow the architect's plans. But it, like the detail that the architect dropped in didn't really apply to the whole situation. And so you got three people pointing fingers at each other and it just started with, you know, just copy, uh, uh, just copying and pasting, just popping yeah. something into the plans, which it's a great detail. It just wasn't the right one for that situation. Yeah, it's important to do your homework. I mean, in Google, I'm a French model, okay? <laughs> I, I look like a mob boss. I'm not a French model by any means, but that's why everybody has to do their homework. Is that person who it is? Is that product the right way to do it? And don't listen to, no disrespect to any dealer and distributor out there, making sure that it is the right product. The dealer and distributor's responsibility is to make sure they have product available, okay? They're not the experts. The experts are the manufacturers and the building science experts, the water management experts. Those are your experts. And again, no, no disrespect to dealers. They, some of them are good out there, that 20% I talked about. But the rest of it is 80% of that product in that distribution center is not the right product for you. You need to do your homework. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, 
you guys, your team, y'all, y'all are experts in, in many areas. And I, I don't use that term lightly, but you're, you're experts, not only in the field of water management, but, you know, building science in general. So I, I love your content that you post on, on LinkedIn a lot for people who are listening or watching who are on LinkedIn. Um, Miguel posts some great stuff all the time, uh, not just about Tamlin and about uh, building science, but also about leadership and life and spirituality and a lot of stuff. Yeah, so every Friday, so you, yeah. you can catch them every Friday. I love, I love your stuff. Um, so again, today we're here to, to mainly talk about water management and the building envelope. Yeah, water intrusion, moisture management, air sealing, all, all those are some of the top causes of construction defect lawsuits. And yet I, I still think that even, even though they are so common, I, th- I think it's probably still one of the least understood topics among contractors. It's the most important thing. It leads to all these, this waterfall of issues. Is it, is it just that it's too expensive to do it right? Or is it just that it's that complicated people to understand it? Or do the builders just not want to get on the ladder and, 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 and look at how something's done? I mean, what's, what's going on? I think it's all the above. Again, I go back to that. What, what happens a lot in, in today's times is that we, we definitely want, I mean, we're in business, right? The builders in business, the manufacturers are in business, the dealers and distributors in business, we want to be profitable, and we always gravitate to the lowest hanging fruit. What we're looking for is something that can get the job done. I hate to say it, the code is a four-letter word, right? <laughs> um, so get it, do the minimum and be the most profitable. So anytime that you exceed the code, that means it's a niche thing. That means it's actually going to do what it says it's going to do, okay? But that's going to cost me money. It's going to take some profit out of my project. Yes, but did you not want to do it right? And if you want to do it right, you're going to have to spend those dollars and then convince the consumer this is what you're selling. So you, as a builder, have to decide where do you want to stand? Do you want to be in the commodity, churn them, churn them, and then hope that you don't get sued? Because at today's time, it's $11 billion litigation on the building envelope per year, $11 billion wow. and growing. Okay. And there and these there's there's law firms out there today that are specifically targeting themselves in major zones for billing envelopes because they know it's low hanging fruit and they're going to get it. Remember, the mold is gold. Yep. That was a time. Okay, right <laughs> now it is billing envelopes are gold for them. They're focusing on these investors. They're not really true builders. They're just coming in, and coming out to make their profit, and they're going to. There's a eighty percent chance they're going to fail. That means there's an eighty percent chance these lawyers are going to get wealth. Yeah, I think that you could probably go to almost any new. I hate to make this generalization, but I'm going to. <laughs> you could probably go to almost almost any of these little uh, little townhouse developments around town uh, that that have been there for five ish years. Mm-hmm. Put some flyers on the door saying, "Are you having any mold problems? Any oh, yeah. air quality problems? Any water problems?" And get a response, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, yes. not to cut you off. <laughs> Julie and I were uh, one of my other colleagues. We were going to visit a job site, right? Taking pictures out of the behest of somebody else. And um, as we were driving by, it's a very stucco-friendly area in Houston. Um, you know, stucco is a uh, cumbersome in a nice way to say cladding. You have to design for it correctly. If you do it the right way, it's okay. Yes, but if you, you but design, most people don't do it the right way. Exactly, especially if we're looking at like five years ago, right? Yeah. Whenever we become very, very stucco friendly, oh, it's easy. You just put it up there and you're done. Not thinking about drainage, rain screens, all those things. And as we were going by, you could see the deficiencies in those existing buildings already popping up, and it was so glaring to see that it's not only this entire neighborhood. But it's if you go a couple of streets down, it's that neighborhood, and you start to see the the key failures of not designing appropriately, right? So mm-hmm. maybe the materials that we're using behind there were installed correctly, but I would be willing to bet that it just wasn't designed, and the correct materials were not used in that application, right? So it's it's one of those things where we have to look to longevity, right? If we take a lot of pride in Team Tamlin, and if you're going to take the time to use our products, which are very very high quality products, we want them to last the test of time, right? We don't want them just to be the uh, the lowest hanging fruit or the easiest option, if you will. And that comes with education. I think education is kind of the continuing uh, thing that keeps coming up in building science, right? Is it that complicated? Absolutely not. Do you have to plan for it? Of course, yeah. right? But it's pretty fundamental. A lot of the mistakes that are made are not 
technical mistakes that are, you know, there a lot of it is really obvious once you actually take a step back and look at the fundamentals. Right? Yeah. There was a, a, a townhouse development. It's about uh, 15 years old, uh, just north of downtown that I was, we got hired on because the people had, again, had, had mold, uh, some stucco was crumbled on the front of the house and we got brought in to replace it. So unfortunately I kind of did two phases of kind of contracts because I didn't know what kind of issues we were going to uncover, uncover, right? So I kind of had one contract to, to tear it off and demo it, figure out a path forward, and then another contract to, to actually repair it. So we tore it off. Um, I had someone from Tamlin out. Uh, this was like nine months ago, so I can't, can't remember who it was. But we, we spec'd out all the products we needed to use. Again, the proposal to fix it. It was a almost a $200,000 fix on a townhouse that they paid $350,000 for 15 years ago. And all the stucco on the, front of, on the front elevation was toast. All the framing was so soft, it just crumbled in your fingers. Like structural beams were crumbling in, in, in my fingers. And the people backed out of our second portion of the contract of fixing it because they, didn't, they couldn't afford to fix it the right way. So they hired somebody else cheap just to kind of slap it back together like it was. So they could sell it or do it again. I guess well, so. It, it's, yeah. it's tough, right? Because uh, you you were speaking about is it really that expensive on the 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 front end, right? You you pay one way or another, right? Yeah. You either pay on the front or you pay when it comes to these repairs, where uh, moisture management, when by the time you're able to identify it visually, it's too late, right? right? So it's not one of those things that if we could see through walls and we could see what moisture is happening. We would be able to, you know, make a lot of money, I think, in that technology, first of all. But you can't really identify these issues until you visually see them, either on the inside or outside. And by that time, you have to do these costly fixes because you've, get, you've gotten into structural problems, mm -hmm. right? And so um, it, it's a challenge. But again, education is really crucial to that because you can inform the architectural and design community and the builder community, hey, this is why it really pays. A, it'll keep you out of problems, but longevity right we want to have good names to the things that we do so yeah unfortunately for those people the build yeah it was 15 years ago so it was kind of out of warranty anyway and the builder was was deceased so <laughs> they were uh, out of luck as far as, as as getting into that fix it was purely out of pocket it's a very very sad situation but what's what's interesting was the people right next door to him had already had all that work done mm -hmm. and i walked down the whole row of townhouses and every single one of them i saw the exact same yep. problem and uh you know I would. I kind of wanted to go knock on the doors, but I, <laughs> I didn't. Here's my card. Yeah. 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 Wow. You know, I, I think that um, this goes back to what I've said quite a few times on this show that I think a lot of builders just blindly trust the tradespeople right. to do it right. When you know the the framer, he may have good intentions, but he likely doesn't have the training. His his job is in his mind is to get in and get out and, and get it done and go on to the next one, especially in these townhouse communities where they're they're building ten of them. Mm -hmm. They they just want to go bang bang bang. So I don't think it's like ill will on the part of the framer, but it's just like a lack of education, and it's the contractor, the builder, the investor is just kind of blindly trusting that they're going to do it the right way. Right. The city inspector is not going to get up on the ladder to go look at that stuff, and probably the the the, the superintendent's not going to get up on the ladder either. So they're trusting. Right. So, you know, that, that's when you've got to have, you know, again, have, have your reps out, have, um, I, I like Rondell and Riley with exterior inspections, mm -hmm. somebody like them doing, doing third-party inspections, people who are actually going to get on the ladder and go up there and look at it and say, hey, this is done right or this is not done right. Oh, yeah, that's, you need that every single time. I mean, there, there's, there's some good builders out there, by, but by all means, I'm not trying to say there's out there. There's a lot of good. Absolutely. Even 20 percent is a lot of a lot of good builders out there, and and I try to follow the the good ones. And and my hope is that other group is watching the 20 percent, and they're slowly getting in for them at 20 percent to expand that. In residential, I would give a lot of credit to the David Weeklies of this world. Amazing work and the training they go through. And they, they learn a lot from uh, Building Science Corp out of Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Joseph Stebrick. Yep. It's a good one to follow. Uh, probably one of the best out there. I see a lot of marketing out there in other groups, yeah. but Building Science Corp out of Massachusetts, by Dr. Joseph Stebrick, the David Weekly, the residential, but in multifamily, the Camdens. Those are the guys mm -hmm. that are doing it right and continue to look for ways to improve. If you think that you're done, you're actually done. Uh, and it's... The way I always tell everybody, what, 
when you're working the hardest, you've just begun. Keep going. Yeah, and you know, you you alluded, you spoke on the rep side of it, and I think that that's a challenge that on the specification side that we continuously have, right? Which is the education. A lot of times, I'm speaking to principal architects that are kind of like what you're saying, but on the other end, they're assuming that these uh, details are correct, right? And then you're you're asking them, wait, you're in you're in Minnesota, like we we know our climate, right? We know what we have to kind of look for. And a lot of them, honestly, just kind of take it for face value. They're like, no, right. this is a detail that we've used for X number of whatever application. Um, and it's frustrating because, again, you, you have to do it through education. You have to just kind of uh, – the course that we do is very uh, fundamental. But even in those fundamentals, a lot of times you get the architects to say, like, oh, wait, you're right. That doesn't, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then that, that starts the trend, right? I think the same thing happens with architects. It happens with builders where oftentimes the owner of the company, the architect of record, or the, the builder, the owner of the company will go take the training class and he'll have this knowledge. But the guys who are actually doing the work, the drafts people, the junior architects, or in the case of the builders, the superintendents may not be getting as much of that education. And so when, when the uh, the head guy is not checking his underlings' work before it goes out the door. That's where a lot of those mistakes happen. Oh, absolutely. Because the, the owner knows better. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Or, 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 or generally knows better, right? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, I, again, it's it, Miguel's talked about that 20% a lot. And, you know, I, I don't want to go too bad on how bad things are. There are people that really try, even on the specification side. But it just helps with the education because a lot of times it's not intentional. Nobody has ill intent to do these things. They right. just kind of see it for what it is. They don't really see these problems. Fast forward a couple of years, you start to see some of these things, right? But by then they're on to the next whatever, and it's kind of a continuous on to the next one um, until it gets really bad, right? Yeah. What's the what, what's the legal the legal phrase like? Uh, not knowing about the law is no excuse. Uh, what's the what's the term? Ignorance of the law is is, is not a defense, right? Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You can't say I didn't know about this. You know. All right, so let's let's talk about uh, rain screens. That's one of the main one of the main topics that I wanted to talk about. Um, and I, I know you guys brought a brought a sample, which we'll we'll hold up here in a second and talk about. I'm I'm still seeing a lot of builders just putting stucco uh, and and other products just flat against a WRB or flat against like a coated OSB system. There's a couple of those out there, <laughs> a green one and a blue one. But uh, I'm still seeing a lot of people just putting that stuff flat against that yeah. that, that sheathing. Just for people who may or may not know what a rain screen is, let's just give some basic definitions. Miguel, why don't you tell us what a rain screen is? Well, a rain screen is a, is a gap that you're creating between your WRB and your final cladding. It's funny that the code specifically says that you, have a, you need a one-inch gap, a rain screen between brick, right? Brick is a porous product. But in today's time, we have a lot of composite material. We have stucco. A lot, and they're sandwiched in between the code says for stucco, two layers of, of building wrap, okay? Uh, felt paper, a synthetic material, two layers. But at the end of the day, when you're sandwiched, it's still just one thick layer, mm -hmm. um, and there's no gap in it. You, the product, the moisture comes in and needs to weep. So the strongest thing in nature in today's time is water, right? We'll never be able to stop it. But like the Mississippi River, we just redirect it into the Gulf where it needs to go. So we weep it into the Gulf of Mexico from one end to the other. It's the same thing with our any building envelope that you had. You will not be able to stop water because it's going to capillary one way or the other. What you can do is redirect it. And that's what rain screen, create a gap. So the 2019 ASTM standard says that now for stucco, you need 316s, a minimum of a 6 millimeter thickness. This is why we came up with a rain screen, a gap. It's a continuous all the way through. We were finding that one by two furnace strips is not a bad thing because you are creating a rain screen. But when those walls were coming off, the, the one by twos were rotted out. Everything else was fine. but So it was, it was not ideal. It was still not bad. Now in the drier climates, those, those are probably okay. But in wet climates like we live in here in Houston, and Louisiana, and Pretty much anywhere on the coastline from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon, you're going to have issues with that. So we needed that particular gap. And when I, in the beginning, I said, when doing it right matters. Okay, so now that you create a gap, a continuous gap, 
we some of the industry had already started looking at mash material because they were using for mortar netting at the bottom of the brick because brick has to have that gap. It was a start. It was nothing wrong with that thought in mind. But even I, as a, a studying the science of this product, thought it would work because in your head it works. It's a compre- it's a, there's a gap in there. But what, then you have the effect of the solar dry. It's pushing it in and pushing it out. Before you know it, that is a compressive material. A mesh is a 70% compressive. So some, so not everything in a rain screen that you think is going to work is going to work. So you have to study the science and the forensics of how everything is moving inside your building. In the wintertime, it's cold inside, so the cladding is sucking itself in. In the summertime, it's pushing itself out because it's looking to dry. So you need something that's non-compressive. That's why the one by two fern strips were working because they were not compressive. Mm-hmm. But when we went to synthetic materials, we found out that mesh, as good as the idea it was, it's going to become a problem, especially for stucco, because now you're going to have cracking because that stuff is moving. Mm-hmm. You want something that doesn't move. And that's why we designed our rain screen product because we wanted something that was continuous and non-compressive and creating a gap. Now, will we stop 100% of the water? Probably not. You have nails, you have capillary. But when you create that mode going across, the bulk water will drop. Little stuff will come out, but hopefully that's why it, it evaporates but going back out. But that's the initiation of a rain screen, a continuous rain screen. The one that we feel that is best practice is a continuous because it allows air to flow omnidirectional anyway. So, Yeah. And so um, you brought a sample of the 6.3, which obviously p- people are listening. They yes. can't see it. But for people who <laughs> yeah. are watching this on, on YouTube, you can, you can see, the, see the sample he brought there. Yeah. So what, what we have is a 6.3 millimeter. Just think of a bunch of marshmallows <laughs> sandwiched between two pieces of cloth or WRB. And they're designed to be about one and a quarter inches apart, continuously up and down. Um, so vertically, horizontally, they're all they're all in there, and it's non-compressive. So whether it's stucco or or, or a James Hardy product, planking, it all goes in. And it it really uh, re, what it does is redirecting the water. If you notice, if anybody can see on YouTube or LinkedIn, there's going to be a gap in there. That's what you're trying to do is create a gap. Remember how we say that there's an 80% chance there's going to be failure in any product project. As manufacturers, when you're manufacturing product, if you're doing it, if you really want to do one and doing it right matters, is manufactured for that 80% that you know they're going to tr- mess it up one way or the other. Right. So what we dis- we thought about this, we have multiple products like this. A rain screen is a, an assistance to that 80%. The chances are they're going to mess it up a little bit. So if we can give them a little bit of a cheater in there, to stop them from doing some of that, that's a win for the hum- the homeowner. That's home for the builder, and that's going to keep the bad wolf away. Yeah, yeah. We, we I call it in my courses hard to mess up. Anything that's hard to mess up is good in our world, right? Because yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen your fair share of things that you're like, there's no way they're going to mess this up. Then you go take a deeper look, like, oh, they messed it up, you know. So that's a product that's very easy to install. So it's hard to mess up, which is a really good thing in our industry. Uh, kind of talking about that 80%. It's just one of those things that non-compressive, when you have that conversation and you start to talk about pressure differentials, you know, not having a continuous uh, drainage plane, uh, it makes so much sense that when you properly educate someone in it, they're like, oh, of course. Like, that makes 100% sense. And you're like, well, yeah, I mean... That's why this is ideal for absorptive claddings, right? And so it's one of those things that people have an aha moment when they're, when on us as manufacturers, we take the time to explain to them, this is the benefit of having a product like this, right? Uh, there are ups and downs of every product, but you understand what works best in that scenario or in that situation. That's what really makes the difference, the educational component of it. And then knowing when to use it, you know? Yeah. So on your sample board there, you've got the rain screen, uh, over OSB, do you, I, I always put down like a, a base layer of like the Tamlin commercial wrap below the, below the rain screen. Is, is that on your sample yeah, there too? Yeah, it is right here. This was opened up. It, it was just to show the OSB, but under here you have a WRB mm-hmm. and then you have those marshmallows I was talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're non-compressive. I'm going to open it up so people can see. Non-compressive it. marshmallows. Yeah, non-compressive <laughs> the marshmallows. The opposite of a marshmallow. <laughs> so if you, <laughs> so if you see that, <laughs> they just look like marshmallows. Little, just little... <laughs> There are dimples in there, so they're non-compressive. Uh, 
and let me correct myself. I think they're they're ninety percent non compressive, but when they're lined next to each other, they're one hundred percent non compressive. The reason you want a little bit of compression in there at ten percent is the impact of the nail. Mm-hmm. You want it's going to have to give a little bit of that you're going to crack uh, composite material. You don't want that to happen. The stucco is not an issue because the stucco is just going to go right on its mash. So right. the mash would go right in here. But for composite material, you want a little bit of compression in there to get. It's a kind of a like a shock absorber for the panel. And it, but so that you have a WR, you have an OSB, you have a WRB, um, then then those uh, marshmallows. I'm calling that compressive <laughs> marshmallows. And then you have the cloth. And if you're doing stucco, then the metal lath would go in there, and then the the final mud would go on top of that. Yeah, right. the Again, product it, is built with the stucco in mind with that extra sacrificial layer on top. So you'll note that a lot of things that Tamlin does is thinking ahead, mm-hmm. not necessarily looking at where we are now, but looking at where we're going, even in code conversations, right? The mm-hmm. conversation has always been uh, behind absorptive cladding, specifically stucco. You have to have a sacrificial layer and moving more towards a rain screen drainable option, right? Mm-hmm. So when you look at our products, um, it may not be what's necessary now, and I always tell architects that will be the, the status quo or the bare minimum moving forward. So kind of getting ahead of why we have the products that we have and how we think when designing these products. Um, and again, that's a challenge, right? Because they, well, Coat says this, you're like, yeah, well, take a look at different markets. Take a look at something like Florida and tell me what, what code requires and what code doesn't require, right? Um, right. So thinking ahead is always uh, the burden on the manufacturer. You know, we have to move ahead and we have to set a new standard for the things that we do. And that's a good example of that. Yeah, and we all have flat wraps. I mean, as a manufacturer of water management products, we have a flat wrap. But flat for us, the flat wrap is the first layer over the OSB or whatever whatever structural panel that you have in there. And then the next layer would be some form of rain screen and then your final product. Right. I'm a firm believer that every single product should have a rain screen slash capillary break. Yeah. When the code put it in place, they asked input, they put it on on brick. Because that was the beginning, you know, they should have done it on all of them. And I think that that's where the the industry needs to go back and there, the STMs need to go re- back into the reports and say, we need range screens on every type of cladding there is out there. Yeah. yeah. We started doing that a couple of years ago, like every single cladding that we're doing gets a rain screen layer. And even even those uh, those coated OSB panels, the the green the green ones that are popular with the tape on them, and then the blue ones that are also popular gaining popularity mm-hmm. by another manufacturer. Um, so th- those are marketed. Hey, your your WRB is built into it, and you're just going to tape it and then put your cladding over that. But those, in in my opinion, and I'm sure yours too, also need another layer on top of that. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that that uh, coated OSBs, it's it's innovation. It's a first generation. And I, and I see those improving. Now you're going to see at the IBS show, stop by some of these booths out there, the new technology that's out there on an advanced product that's out there. You're going to be, it's going to put some of this coated OSBs to bed. They all need a, a rain screen. They all need a capillary break. They need that. It's the first generation. I see that even those companies are going to improve on what they have. They need to. They're comfortable with it. They're also going to die. Look what happened to What's that original phone company before Samsung came to play out of Canada? Um, see, it's we before already, my time. You see, we already time. forgot about <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, we look at those products. It In some applications, they work really well. Uh, but when we're looking at having a drainage plane behind them, um, it's never, and it's, again, one of those fundamental things, putting two materials that are flat in direct contact will never work out for you. Even they're selling their own rain screen now that they're that they're saying our product needs this rain screen on top of it in certain applications. Yeah, yes, they, and they, it's, they, uh, it's having a drainable behind any kind of application just kind of ensures that you have uh, better drainage faster, right? Yes. And the name of the game is moisture management, not moisture uh, elimination. You just have to learn to move it around. Water always finds a way. <laughs> Path of always, least resistance. Water always finds a way. And yeah. so it, it's just how are you going to manage it when it does find a way? Yep. Right. We just got to prepare ourselves and educate the people of all the things that can happen if you don't do it right. Um, but that's a that's a fear that most people have. You know, the pharmaceutical companies, you'll see these commercials on TV uh, about the new drug, blah, 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 this new drug that's there. But the commercial is a mile long above all the things that could go <laughs> wrong with you. Right. Okay? They're really not there to sell you the drug. Now the lawyer said, you knew the drug was bad, but you still bought it, okay? 
So there, everybody thinks, well, this pharmaceutical company is selling me this drug. They have no intentions of selling you that drug. They're, the doctors are already being pitched about that. They're there on TV to tell you all the things that are going to go wrong. So when you come sue us, you already knew about this. <laughs> okay. So this is what we have to know as consumers. What's the, all the possibilities that can go wrong with my home? And what am I doing right to make that right? Yeah. So I don't know if it was one of you guys or if it was John Sanchez or somebody recently posted, I think on LinkedIn, um, some pictures of one of those coded OSBs that had a lot of failure on it. Yeah. What, what, uh, what in, in your experience causes those types of failures? Is it, is it lack of a rain screen? Is there something else going on there? I mean, I, I know it can vary, but yeah, it, I mean, it varies. It's always, it, you know, more than most, you rip it out. You start to see a lot of what goes wrong, right? You can't really see it. I actually was driving by looking at another project and I saw that and I took a picture of it, um, not to disparage anybody, but just use as an uh, opportunity to educate, right? To yeah. really understand how bad things can go and how quickly that happens. A lot of times we think, well, five years, two years, some of this stuff starts to go really bad, especially with absorptive claddings under a year, right? Uh, that specific situation looked, and I didn't get up there uh, to kind of peak, but I would assume there was no drainage plane behind there. Mm. And what you saw was major deterioration of not only that stucco cladding, but even the structural components. Mm -hmm. And it, um, it got a lot of attention, mostly because you kind of see... It, Systems in themselves are not bad, but when you ask something to outperform what it can handle, it's just going to fail time and time again, right? Yeah. Um, it, that specific design is made to handle a certain kind of application. So when you ask it to outperform, it's just not made for that. And so that was a good learning opportunity to kind of show, look, these products are really good, really innovative. Like most things are going to continue to get better, but we have to know what we're asking that system to do, yeah. right? And so drainage is, it's, uh, you'll learn one way or another with, with lack of drainage, you know. I'm definitely not saying uh, by any stretch, like, don't use those products. I, I mean, um, and I'm not like bashing them. Like, mm -hmm. so we're, we're building a, uh, we are building a house right now for a, another manufacturer that we'll talk about in, in the future. I can't tell, say who it is yet. But anyway, we're building a house for another major building product manufacturer as their, their model house, their show house. And the architect and, and we uh, agreed that we're going to use a green coated OSB product on the house. We're going to tape, tape the seams. Um, but it was really more for from an air sealing perspective. Correct. Yeah. Because when you when you have that, you tape it, you liquid flash it. Uh, you've, got, you've got a really great assembly for, for um, maintaining a, a very low ACH on the structure. So, but we came to Tamlin and we said on top of our air ceiling, we want to create a great structure that's going to drain properly, that's going to perform because that house has got a mix of stucco, stone, and siding, all three on mm -hmm. the elevation. And we want to make sure that we're using the right products. So, you know, we, we came to you guys and, and y'all spec'd out some products that we're about, about to install pretty soon on that house. So again, I'm not, I'm not dissing sure, yeah, those yeah. products. They have their place. No, absolutely. And yeah. I think that they need to be used as part of a larger system. And I, right. I think system is always what we go back to, right? Yeah. So it, when you're speaking about having a lot of different claddings, um, it, it's always a good idea to have a continuous drainage barrier behind all those things. Yeah. Right? Um, systems, you know, everything that we do in our CU courses to architects is priorities, right? What's your first priority? Bulk water. Take care of your bulk water. That starts with a good WRB, having a drainage plane. And then after that, we look at air and trained moisture, right? Making sure it's airtight. So um, when you look at things as a whole, and then we can get into vapor diffusion, which tends to be what everybody wants to talk about, right? What's the perm level? What's this? Uh, but when we prioritize in that way, we start to create systems that just make sense, right? So air detailing is very important. But if we're not taking care of our bulk water, then you're kind of, <laughs> you're kind of taking something good and kind of giving up one of the most important parts of that. Yeah. And what we're looking for is redundancy is what I call, so the, the, the coated materials is, a, is, again, it's an innovative product, but are we, there's nothing better than redundancy. You know, so when this morning I looked at the weather outside, you know, what, what shall I wear? Okay. Well, how about I just make sure I do a little bit of extra. I put an undershirt on and a shirt on top of it, just in case it was, you know, 
a little on the colder side than expected. So expect the unexpected. Throw your uh, your raincoat in the, <laughs> in the car yeah, too. So yeah. kind of expect the unexpected. So I'm a firm believer in redundancy. So the coated OSB, another layer of WRB on top of it, and preferably a WRB that has a rain screen or a capillary brake built into it. Again, going back, there should never be any building envelope without a capillary brake or rain screen, a mode to protect it. You know, look at the castles. There were no dummies. They put modes all around it. They needed, <laughs> they needed something to protect themselves. They, they had the humongous walls, right? Why, why, why a mode? It was another layer of defense. That is what we need, a secondary layer of defense to protect this castle that we invested a lot of money on. So one of the other things that I, I talk to Toner a lot about on this show is using systems of products, which you touched on. So I think that this is something that I stress to people all the time. Because the same job that, that I mentioned a second ago where I came out and they had the TAM1 detail on the page, but it didn't really apply. The same job, the builder had used a paint-on waterproofing on top of that green-coated OSB and then used another brand of tape. And it was just like a bunch of layers that weren't compatible with each other. And I, I've just pulled up my phone the warranty documents for that product and I said, says right here, <laughs> do not coat this product with any other, with any other um, paint-on waterproofing product. Yeah. I said, you, you just void, voided your warranty. So it's important to stress how manufacturers, like I'm, I'm sure that you guys do this and like, like everyone does, you test your products with how they perform with other products and how they perform with your own products. Correct. And so right. when you're buying Tamlin rain screen, Tamlin uh, drainable wrap, Tamlin commercial, whatever, Use the Tamlin tape, use the Tamlin flashings. It's designed to work together as a system, right? Well, Absolutely. And then we also, what we try to do is we do add a little study further beyond that. So what if happens, worst case scenario, we're out of something. So we want something that's also compatible. So we'll make available, uh, Joe Builder, listen, we he calls us in 10 bucks to Ohio. Your product is not available. Well, these two other items are compatible. Yeah. So we're it's kind of a fail safe for him to make him feel good that we are looking out for him more than anything else. Well, you know, we can't just say, well, use what it's out there. We have to it's a feel good for us. We need to know that what other options do we have in case the worst case scenario happens that we were out of inventory. Yeah. I went to the um the Tremco facility. Mm -hmm. Remember Tremco? They manufacture a lot of different ad adhesives and sealants and things like that. I went to their facility in Cleveland, Ohio mm -hmm. a few months back with Toner. And I was blown away at how they did their testing. They had, you know, multiple wall sections set up in different environments, you know, water being sprayed on it. Then they had 20 different other brands of products that they were painting on and using different brands of tapes, all to show how their product worked with other people's products. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you as a manufacturer don't want your product to fail because somebody used something that, that, that that's, that's not the right product, right? No, absolutely. So we were testing some of the, our product that we had for uh, the liquid apply flashing. And we tried a, one of the top brands out there, and it did not perform well with our WRV product. Not that there's nothing wrong with the top brand. It's a very good brand. But our substrate did not marry well with it. Mm -hmm. So that was a no. Uh, for us. So that's why, yeah. so we put that on file. We know that when somebody calls, well, can I use this product? The answer, not on our product, but it does work on these other yeah. things. So it's, <laughs> no, yeah, it's, do, uh, do your you, homework. You, you mentioned the system approach and oftentimes on the manufacturer side, it's a challenge, right? Because everybody feels like you're trying to sell them a system. Right. Um, but it, it'd be really cool to, to see you uh, participate in one of our CU courses because when you break it down in that kind of way, understanding that Yes, we would love for Tamlin to be in everything, right? But the benefit of the system is that these things are tested together. And so we know that they work well together. Now, when you take a buffet approach to different things and you say, I'm going to get brand A here, brand B here, brand C, uh, you can do that, but you have to do your homework. And oftentimes people do not do their homework. And so they just expect these things to work perfectly together. And um, it gets, can get pretty bad pretty quick if it just doesn't work, especially when you get into warranties and you get into stuff like that. Yeah. Um, even in the CU courses, I would love for all of them to, you know, spec Tamlin. But I always tell people, whenever you're looking at any kind of detail, always refer to the manufacturer. Refer to what they're asking you to do, because um, if that fails, you're not going to come talk to me. You're going to go talk to that manufacturer. 
They're going to say, what did we say to do and to not do? And uh, it's very clear, right? So I always tell people the benefit of a system approach is that these things get tested together. So we can be very confident that they work the way we're saying that they work, yeah. right? Guys don't like to read the instructions. You know, we, <laughs> yeah. we just like to rip it off yeah. and yeah, yeah. slap we, it yeah. on. And we, we just want, we want to do it fast. And I, I guess I'll get, I love to give analogies. So just imagine that you're in the German Autobahn. Okay, you're going at 180 miles an hour, but you have two choices. There's two people on there. One's that fast BMW motorcycle, and the other one's a Hummer that only goes at 20 miles an hour. It's a tank, okay? At the other end, if you finish, it's $100,000 who you finished, okay? But you have to, the fastest ones that gets there. Who's going to win? The Hummer is, because the guy on the motorcycle is going to die every single time, okay? That's a good way to put it. Yeah. I didn't know where you were going, but it made sense <laughs> halfway there. I like it. My wife is a chemical engineer, and uh, you know she'll she'll tell you that you know putting two products or on top of each other, <laughs> yeah. applied to each other, that yeah. the chemistry in each product may not play well together. Yeah, you know, and my... that's that's what people don't understand is that this this testing t- is is taking into account the chemistry of the various adhesives and products and. Y'all aren't just saying that to, so that they buy yeah. the Tamlin tape or they no, buy the Tamlin no, caulking or yeah, whatever. It's yeah. it, do these products chemically bond to each other? Yeah, and it again, it's a the format of a CU course is very it's challenging, but it's also very beneficial because you have to be impartial to what you're speaking about, right? You have to speak about just what's true, what's not true. Can't get into specific brands, and even when we're looking at a system approach in that way, it just makes so much sense to say if these things are designed to work together let's use them together sure you can get outside of that but then you're taking a big risk that everybody that works in your group is doing the homework and their due diligence to make sure that yes this is compatible to this like you said we don't like to read instructions right when you start to look at some of those uh, data sheets they're long there's a lot of language in there and so you kind of have to dig through them and so oftentimes I tell people whether it's tamlin whether it's whoever it's always a good idea, if possible, to go for a full system approach and understand that that is going to be the best way to get the most value out of these potentially great products that are out there. So, and it, I mean, it follow follow the science, but also follow those people that have been doing it for a long time that understand why they're called experts. And it's not because they succeeded, it's because they failed a lot. Mm-hmm. And that's how they succeeded. We we become experts in this industry because we screwed up so bad. Uh, it's just uh, going back to the mesh material. Spent a lot of quality time on designing the mesh material for the com- compressive mesh. Did patents on it. Spent thousands of dollars on something, and then threw it in the trash. Yep. Because after I put it on the wall, it didn't do what I thought it was going to do. But up here it did. Yep. And the unfortunate thing, there's a lot of product. It's on the wall. That's on today's walls. Because they just used this and they didn't test it on the field. Yeah, we, we get a lot of calls about uh, things when they go wrong. You know, like, hey, you know, we did this. Uh, yes, you did a great CU course, but we decided to go with whatever we were going with and things start to get a little weird. And so we go in there and we see time and time again the failures of compressive materials, especially when they're trying to be utilized as a rain screen or as some sort of drainage, enhanced drainage. Um, again, moisture is going to take the path of least resistance, right? So if you give it uh, pressure differentials or difference, you have the ability for capillary action. And so uh, unfortunately, we always like to do it right the first time because it's saved you the most time, saved you the most money. And it, uh, it, it really just makes sense moving forward, especially with the system approach in mind. You know. So aside from the rain screens, um, what are some other exterior products that you guys sell that kind of, you know, work along with your, your rain screen, your house wrap systems. Uh, I know that y'all do tapes. We mentioned flashings. Tell right. us about your other, your other products. So we, we manufacture synthetic uh, butyls. We also have asphalt bitumen butyls that we have, but for, for the uh, window openings, we have those little plastic corners. It's another thing that we learned the hard way. Yeah. So we have flexible tape uh, in the 100 pound gorillas have their flexible tape, whether it's synthetic butyl yep. or latex. And one thing that we learn in corners, and we learn it the hard way after taking the walls down, that there is no flexible tape that actually works. It has a memory and wants to come back slowly. The, 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 the manufacturer will tell you, just nail it with a cap nail and stretch it and nail it in there. Well, you're stretching something that wants to come back. It eventually will come back. So we designed a corner, plastic corner that goes on the windows 
and then just a flat flat tape will take care of it. And, and we found that that the same little bitty corner is less expensive than our more expensive flexible tape that everybody thinks works, but it doesn't. And this is what we're educating the consumer. Said, listen, we we were wrong about our flexible tape. It doesn't do what we thought it did. But these corners here are your answer for it. Yeah, the so the education is crucial, right? Because we see that um, type of tape being used all the time. So let's live in a hypothetical where that tape does exactly what we ask it to do, right? It doesn't uh, fish mouth, for lack of better term, back up there. Even when you install, especially if you've actually installed a window, those corners of the windows tend to catch that tape. And once it rips that tape, not only are you not aware that that tape is gone, it's already, you're on to the next one, right? Yeah. You're starting to put the window up there. You're not going to take it out and say, oh, look, I ripped a little bit of it. Once that flange is covering it, oh, you're not going to yeah, see that exactly. damage. Yeah. And so the, the benefit of having these pre-manufactured corners is that you can do it right every single time, right? It's a simple installation. Um, no need to have your bow tie or your, you know, whatever method you want to have with tape. Um, and it's really hard to mess up. And right. again, that's such an important part when it comes to doing it consistent every single time. Right. Um, it, it's just one of those things where Miguel already said you, you throw things out there. You, you have an idea in your mind with how they're going to work. But then you are also humble enough to say, hey, this is not this is not working. So let's look at a different option. Right? That tape's really expensive, too. I, yeah. Those corners have to be less expensive than tape, aren't they? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. They're less expensive. You know, we're, we're making less money on it. So why should we sell them? <laughs> we, we need to be selling this flexible tape because we have more profit for us. But again, we, we chose to do it right, and we're just going to do it right. Cap nails or cap screws versus staples. That's a huge one. We found out that every single time you're using the staples and, and putting the staple gun on it, you're tearing in your WRB every single mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So we're creating our own problems by tearing in our WRB. Wind will knock up that, uh, that staple up a whole lot faster than the cap nail. Also, the cap nail, because of the little plastic, slows down capillary through that nail. So there's a lot of positive things on a cap nail, and there's 100% negative things <laughs> on, on a staple. Yeah. So that's a pitch that we always say, do not use staples on a WRB. They love using those because they can just go through and just pat, yeah, pat, 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 it goes pat, quick. Yes. Well, I, I, I always say, any, anytime you have a, whenever you're looking at your options for WRB, if they don't have a cap nail specified, I always tell people, mm -hmm. just take a deeper look because that's a good starting point where something is not really thought through, right? Rough openings. We preach, we preach, we preach. Yet you're like Miguel said, you're creating a bunch of rough openings without having any sort of uh, like remedy for it. At least you have something that you're thinking about it. It's, it closes that rough opening better. And so you know, it, it's it's things that we're very adamant about because we are very passionate about building envelope because we want people to use our products, but we want it to put it up there and then just brag about what it did, right? And so you have to build in a lot of redundancies. We are one of the few people, I don't know anybody else that uses a double-sided seam tape that only allows you not only to shingle style, but seal up underneath. So it gives you built-in redundancies for what you need, right? It'd be a lot easier for us to just say, just tape the seams up. It's fine. But we've seen through time and time again, having shingle style approach to installation is good. Then being able to detail it as a continuous air barrier underneath that double-sided tape just makes so much more sense, especially when we're looking at building enclosure and you're getting into bulk water, but also air and train moisture, right? And so it's built-in redundancies that may not seem significant in our, and Miguel would probably be able to tell you, a lot easier to not do, but kind of designing those into place and taking the time to educate that this is why we do what we do is huge. Um, everything that we do in building envelope has a, has an, has a philosophy in mind why we do it. It's, it. None of it is the easiest way to do things. You guys also do some uh, flash, some flashing panels, right, and some metal flashings and termination caps and things like that. Absolutely, we'll customize anything for a consumer, whether it's a, a parapet at the top, a window flashing, and any. We have eighty five hundred different colors that we can customize to a project. We currently, you currently see us in Dunkin' Donuts, Pizza Huts, um, Dairy Queens, McDonald's. Yeah, that's everywhere. Everywhere. Trust me, once yeah. you start looking for it, yeah. you're like, oh, there it is, there it is. <laughs> Cause it's, it's, it's just, it's about shingle fashion. It's about flashing properly, but it's also about looking aesthetically pleasing. We want to make sure yeah. it looks attractive along with um, the the panels, the fiber cement panel. We work real close with the fiber cement industry, like James Hardy. Uh, I think James Hardy, Nichiha, um, Lura, there's some of the companies, but James Hardy was the, yep. the, the, the first one in the industry. We make a lot of reveals, uh, aesthetic reveals that make that uh, attractive. As stucco is is one of those things that not too many people like to do because they're the fear of it. 
if they do it right, it's a, it's a great mm-hmm. product. It's mm-hmm. been it's been around for hundred years, but if they don't want to go to that process, there's a reveal system that a lot of these fiber seam manufacturers have that look like stucco. So without reveals, it, it, it just definitely looks very attractive and modern. Yeah. So to, the generation that's coming in right now is the millennials and the Z's. Those are the buyers right now. Okay. They don't like the planking because they don't want to live in grandma's house. Okay? Right. So they want that modern look, the attractive modern look. So when you're installing a piece of planking on a house or a panel in the house, the minute you finish with the planking, it already looks like grandma's house. But the panel, 50 years from now, will still look modern. Right. So that's the that's what we have been emphasizing is a lot of the modern classy looks. Yeah, and then you look through our full product, different catalogs, different lines. One thing that you'll come across pretty quick is that they all have moisture management in mind. Even our reveal system takes into account managing a moisture. All of our horizontal reveals have a slight angled edge to kind of understand that moisture is going to get behind there. And so... Everything we do is kind of centered around understanding the right way to do it as opposed to just a way to do it. Um, and it, it, again, it's a, it comes down to us on the educational side because you really have to advocate. That this is why you can't use a vertical reveal horizontally, right? It doesn't make sense to a person who doesn't really look at it every day. But that education and understanding that everything that we do has moisture management in mind, you can get something that looks really slick, but then you can also get the security that it's going to perform well. And ultimately, that's what... Um, that people really like pretty things until they <laughs> they mess up, right? Until you have to tear it down and then you have to call Curtis and he has to tell you the... <laughs> yeah, so kind of like we talked about at the beginning, yeah. you know, having the, having the resource of you guys to help you choose the right products is, is huge for me. Um, when, we, when we get a new project, if it's, whether it's a modern house, we have some of those details you're talking about, or a traditional house with lap siding or whatever, I like to call, well, uh, I keep wanting to say John, but John John's <laughs> mo- mo- has moved up in the world. John Sanchez was my rep, <laughs> yeah. my rep for a long time, but he's, he's moved on to bigger and better things in the company now. But anyway, so I'll, I'll call, I'll call my talent rep and say, okay, he, here's our plans for this project. What products do we need to use to make this successful? And you guys are very helpful in giving me a list of products and this is what you need. And yeah, and we, t- we try to be as sincere as possible about what you're looking for. Um, a big part of the specifications role is really taking a look at what the client wants and then making it happen, right? And so what we always want to do is establish those relationships. I get no benefit if I ask you to use something that's not going to necessarily serve you in that purpose, right? And so a big part of Tamlin's culture is being very genuine, very sincere about what the customer is wanting, Give them exactly what they want and show them what they're going to need and why they need it. Or tell, yeah, tell them, tell them what they need. If yeah. they, if, if they want something that doesn't really jibe with what is going to be a good product, then yeah. be honest with them and tell them, I know that you want, you think you want yeah, that, exactly. but here's yeah. why this is a better way to do it. Yeah. And right. education is great for that, right? You start to kind of talk to them, you break it down, you uh, zoom out and then they start to see the picture. That makes sense. No longer does it turn into, why are you trying to push a drainable or rain screen on me, it becomes, oh, I understand. If I'm using stucco, I have to understand that that's an absorptive cladding that's going to get moisture. And if you don't have a consistent drainage plane, you're going to get yourself into some issues. And you want to see some issues, we can drive around Houston and I'll show you a couple a couple sites that uh, <laughs> kind of fall victim to that. Yeah. You can drive for 15 minutes in any direction <laughs> in Houston and yeah. find some good examples. Yeah. So, all right. So, that's going to kind of wrap up our conversation for the day. I just wanted to say again, um, for people who are listening, if you're a builder and you need some good advice on on putting together a good exterior assembly, or you just want to learn more about what Tamlin does, please reach out to, to Milton. Uh, Miguel, be sure and follow Miguel on LinkedIn. <laughs> Check out some of his awesome content that he's putting out. Um, but, you know, just go to their website. Uh, Danielle is going to link that in the show notes and on all our places that we're pushing this. Uh, so you can find Tamlin. They're easy to find. T-A-M-L-Y-N. <laughs> and uh, anyway, you guys have... A, such a wealth of knowledge on these topics and i always enjoy talking to you about it well thank you curtis we uh we're excited to be here Uh, one of the things we always want to share with the industry is that just do your homework Mm -hmm. just do your homework and you're not going to be disappointed when you do that and don't expect that everything that's coming out is going to be working for you don't that's the biggest naive thing that we all have we're human beings we just want we want somebody else to do it for you, and they said it was going to work. Don't do that. Just do your homework. There's experts out there, the Tamlins, but there's a lot of people in the industry that have a building science background, construction building science backgrounds. Don't just rely on me as a manufacturer. 
get your additional references from somebody else out there in the industry. How does this product perform? Why do I need this? Don't just take somebody's word for it. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. You know, it's a, uh, we, we love to be a resource, you know, um, those conversations are always a lot more pleasant. I'd rather be called beforehand than afterwards, right? right. Um, because then it becomes a much tricky uh, managing moisture, building enclosure, building envelope. There is no easy fix. You know, you your entire world is fixing things correctly. And sometimes people get hit with the harsh reality of what it takes time-wise, also when it comes to resources to fix something correctly, especially when things go wrong with moisture management. Miguel said it's $11 billion a year. That's... Um, by far the leading thing. So, we, you know, we, we'd love to be used as resources. And we know a lot of people in the industry that are also good resources. And the, the idea is to be collaborative, right? To understand that um, you win, we win. And so that that's really what we want. We want to be used as a resource, right. especially when it comes to the education side of things. We, we promise that if we don't have the answer, we're going to get it for you. Like I said, we've, <laughs> yeah. we've got such a wealth of information that was gathered by friends in the industry that we have that want to do it right, just like we are. You know, I, I said that 20%, but 20% is a large group in the, mm -hmm. our industry. Mm -hmm. I could go back to, to Toner is a great example. He has a wealth of knowledge yourself out there. But a lot of people, even the 800-pound gorillas, there's some good people in all these di different areas. And like I mentioned, Dr. Joseph Stebrick with Building Science Corporation. He's a guru in this industry that we, a lot of us lean on to. Is there some things I don't agree with him? Who doesn't? I mean, we're humans. We're not going to agree with everything. Sure. But I agree with 80% of what he says. And that, to me, is a lot. In baseball, it'd be worth billions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we started this uh, podcast originally to, to kind of help homeowners make good decisions. So I, I started this just focused toward homeowners. Had a lot of architects and builders and that sort of thing on. But um, part of it was I realized that I had more builders listening than, than homeowners. <laughs> so we're still doing a lot of homeowner-focused stuff. But I, I, I personally really have a passion for educating builders to prevent these problems. So, yes, I still want to educate the homeowner so they make better decisions. Mm -hmm. But I really have a passion for educating the builder so that they're building a better product uh, so that I'm not getting called in <laughs> to, to, to be yeah. on the other side of the table from them. Because I, I, I hate when I go to a job site and there's a builder who I know didn't have bad intentions yeah. and he's getting hammered by the attorney and I'm getting paid to give advice that's going to put him in a big hole, you know, I, I hate that. So I, I want to help educate those guys, those younger guys, especially uh, so that they're not making these mistakes. Right. I mean, sometimes you just got to listen to your gut feeling and your, the common, let common sense kick in when the lawyer says, explain to me why you use cardboard as a structural <laughs> panel. But, I said cardboard and I said structural panel in the same sentence. It just doesn't line up. So if you're, that means that you did not use common sense, you, you know, <laughs> on that. It's, I mean, I see a lot of that. When, and yeah. No bashing to the cardboard. They need, they're great boxes, okay? But they don't belong in construction. <laughs> I was going to say, the only time cardboard is a structural panel is when it's in your fort <laughs> that you built when you were a kid. Yes, you that's go. exactly yeah. it. So there's a lot of, Cardboard structural issues, and I'm just saying not the actual product. Every single section of the wall, there's going to be some bad. But I tell you, when the bad wolf comes knocking, he's never going to come knocking because you have a little rusty faucet. <laughs> he doesn't care about that. The billing envelope, that covers his whole package. Yep. He, he wants in, and he's going to come in. And that's why we have so many shows that we've done that are kind of on the whole building envelope topic. It's just, it's, it's, it's the big one. Yep, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Anyway, thank you guys again for being with me today. It's Thanks been so it's been Chris. great chatting with you. And like I said, if you guys want to check out Tamlin, uh, we're going to link all their information in the show notes. Follow these guys on social media. They put out lots of good stuff. And thank you for joining us on today's episode of the UR Project Shepherd podcast. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. If you found us helpful and enjoyed listening, please support us by liking and subscribing here on your podcast platform and also join us on our YouTube channel. We want to continue to bring you high quality content and expert guests and your support truly helps us to continue this journey. If you have any questions for me or my guests or any feedback for us, you can email us at podcast at yourprojectshepherd.com. Thanks again.